West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Des photos de bord de mer Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Dans mon jardin d'hiver Back in August of last year, when the FBI executed that search warrant at Mar-a-Lago, investigators found 102 documents with classified markings. At the time, we got a few details about those documents, mostly that they seemed pretty important and pretty secret. But now that the DOJ's indictment has been made public, well, we have a much fuller picture. According to the indictment, the FBI recovered 17 top secret, 54 secret, and 31 confidential documents from Trump's office and from an unguarded storage room. And now under the Espionage Act, the DOJ is charging Trump with the willful retention of 31 of those documents. And that includes a top secret document dated May 6, 2019, concerning White House intelligence briefing related to foreign countries, including military activities and planning. A top secret document dated June 20th, 2020 concerning nuclear capabilities of a foreign country, a top secret undated document concerning military attacks by a foreign country, an undated document concerning military contingency planning of the United States, and a secret document dated December of 2019 concerning foreign country support of terrorist acts against U.S. interests. That list goes on. The indictment also accuses Trump of disseminating classified information on at least two occasions, but it very conspicuously does not charge him for it. The first instance in that dissemination allegation took place in July of 2021 at Trump's golf club in Bedminster, New Jersey, where Trump allegedly showed and described to four people a plan to attack Iran, none of whom possessed a security clearance. The second instance was in August or September of 2021, also at Bedminster, where Trump showed a representative of his political action committee, who again did not possess a security clearance. He showed him a classified map related to a military operation. According to investigators, Trump told this person he should not be showing him the map, but he did it anyway. Now, we don't know if federal prosecutors will maybe eventually charge Trump with dissemination of classified information. They certainly have that option. But we do know that the bulk of evidence the DOJ has amassed here relies on some very secret, very confidential documents. And that raises a very important question. How do prosecutors convince the jury of Trump's guilt when the charges are based on top secret information that the jury might not be allowed to see? Joining us now is David Aaron, former federal prosecutor and intelligence attorney with the U.S. Department of Justice and a former Manhattan assistant, assistant district attorney. His experience includes investigating and litigating cases involving, wait for it, Espionage Act violations. David, it's great to see you. There is no better person to be talking to about this. Thank you. And I will say I have found it a little bit confusing to, to really understand, OK, if this stuff is all very secret and boy, does it sound secret. How do you actually use it in a trial? What's the process by which the DOJ can actually show this stuff in a meaningful way? It's a great question. It's an important question. Um, in a case like this, the classified information has to be shown to the jury. Uh, the jury has to look at it and decide for itself whether the information qualifies as national defense information. 
The government can say it's classified, but only the jury can say that it's national defense information. That's a question of fact. So unlike other cases where you might be able to summarize uh, classified information or substitute something that's less sensitive, this actually has to be shown to the jury. And that means it also has to be provided to the defense. Mm. Uh, the government wants to protect this information from disclosure, but it also needs to afford the defendant his due process rights. So there are procedures that are available to the government to allow that to happen to provide a fair trial while protecting the information. So how is the jury, what are those, I mean, without getting in too granular, I mean, is it just heavily redact? I mean, how do you, how do you do that? How does a jury get access to determine whether it's NDI? Sure. Well, it can't be redacted. Anything you redact, uh, the jury wouldn't be able to take into consideration. So there are procedures that the, the government will ask for before trial. This will all get worked out before trial um, under the Classified Information Procedures Act, which provides a framework for those uh, decisions by the judge. Now, there's a, a procedure that's likely to be used here because summaries and substitutions won't work, and that's called the silent witness rule. Mm -hmm. And that's a way to show that evidence to the jury and let the defendant see it and let the defendant ask questions about it, but in a way that disguises it or, or uses coded references. Ah. So, the so jury, instead of saying Iran, you'd say Ireland. Well, you'd, say, it, that, you'd it, say country A. Uh, okay. You wouldn't want <laughs> right. to give any misapprehensions. Sure. Um, but uh, no, you, you might use country A instead of a specific country, person A instead of a specific person, and the jury would have a key. Or you might show these documents that are referred to in the indictment to the jury and you wouldn't put them up on the screen like in a regular case and your witness might say to the jury if you look at page two line five and describe what's going on there without revealing any of that classified information. Uh, that is tricky. Yeah, and the, the critical thing is the defense has to be able to use that same code to do effective cross-examination or else it's not a fair trial. Right, because the defense needs access to yeah. these documents in a meaningful way. I would assume, I mean, we read a litany of oh, a selection of some of the documents in their sort of vague but but specific uh, descriptions of what, what is in these classified top secret and secret documents. I would assume the, the, the DOJ made a, a very, it was a very conscious effort and a very specific effort to call from the 137 documents, I think. Am I making that up? I can't remember the number. The number of documents they charged on, I think, is 31. That's not yep. all the documents. They, they cherry picked. Can you talk a little bit about why they didn't take all the documents he had retained uh, unlawfully and instead picked these 31, what the metric was? Sure. And, you know, I don't know exactly what metrics they applied in this case, but, you know, I've handled cases involving very large amounts of classified information and you have to choose what are you going to use to prosecute. One thing you want to do is give yourself a manageable case, mm -hmm. a case that can be tried in a reasonable amount of time. And if you assign, you know, one count to each document, um, then you have a you know, manageable number of counts. And if there's any problem uh, with evidence or, or other issues with one count, you can dismiss that one or lose on that one and the other ones survive. And when it comes to the specific documents that you're choosing, if you have a lot to choose from, you're going to be talking to the intelligence community about which ones will the intelligence community allow the prosecutors to use. Right. And the prosecutors want to use the most sensitive ones possible uh, that are very straightforward and easy for the jury to understand. The intelligence community really wants to hold those back and not risk them. And so you know, the two sides kind of go back and forth and they, they settle on what some people refer to as the Goldilocks documents. They're, they're sensitive enough. They're not too hot. They're not too cold. They're just right. Exactly. They are just right. They, they are serious enough to convey to the jury the, uh, you know, how they relate to national security, why their disclosure could cause harm. But they're not so super, super secret that the intelligence community just, just won't allow them out. So the suggestion here is there's even more secret paper out there that may, Trump may have uh, retained down at Mar-a-Lago. We just don't know about it because the intelligence community is like, uh-uh, DOJ, not on our watch. Uh, it's, it's certainly a possibility. Um, what, what of this article from Andrew Weissman and Ryan Goodman, they, they suggest that the dissemination claim, which is in the indictment, that, that the DOJ isn't charging on a potential dissemination because they're keeping effectively uh, a card in their back pocket. Do you, do you think that you know, what we have in the indictment, the evidence that's cited, is strong enough for a dissemination case? It's, it's hard to say. Um, there's not as much detail given about that as, as there is about other parts of the indictment. And there's no way to tell, looking at the indictment, how, how easy it would be to prove 
uh, the dissemination or disclosure of, of those two items of, of potential national defense information. So I don't know uh, why those uh, weren't charged in New Jersey. They, they, they may be. Um, they probably couldn't be charged in Florida because no aspect of those particular alleged crimes occurred in Florida, so there wouldn't be venue. It is Thursday, the 15th of June of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, our little Yorkie, is the door girl who will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Mm, yes, a little spice. Some of us can take a lot more, and some of us can only take a little. But we all need some spice. Okay, it's the morning, and are you ready for spicy? <laughs> you better. Because, uh, I don't know, ever since that guy came down the escalator, everything's been escalating. What has happened? Are we in some sort of time slip? I wonder about that at times. How events, you know, sort of careen the world into, or is it career? The world into uh, uh, states that uh, were unimaginable, or they were imagined but thought that could never be possible. And here we are. All right. Think of all those little short stories and all the science fiction uh, uh, novels and movies or whatnot that described this particular guy. Even in Superman. I mean, come on. Is this Lex Luthor? Okay. I think we should uh, write into the Constitution or some regulatory aspect of campaign finance that uh, uh, commercial real estate people can't. No, no, you can't really be president. Too many entanglements. All right. Uh, I would venture to say, and this might the this might sound sort of bigoted or prejudiced towards. Uh, Buku rich people like Trump who have some sort of exalted sense of self that causes them to believe that they are above all laws, all conventions of man, because they are gods. I actually believe he believes that. So I know it sounds a little bit like I'm prejudiced against the rich. I'm, I'm not prejudiced against the rich because that means that you have to prejudge what about when you're post-judging events like or behaviors like this? Okay, my analysis of this whole predicament that we're in is that uh, this guy, like most buku rich people, they have no national allegiances. They don't believe in, quote, community. Jesus, they abhor that. They want gates and fences and walls between them and us. What I always liked about urban planning or planning in general in America is that um, we didn't build walls. You go to Europe and you go around and you, you, you stumble into almost every town's a walled town. And why was that? Because there were roving bands of brigands. Causing mayhem and havoc. And so we thought, well, you know, we're, we're the result of the Enlightenment, and we're supposed to be more enlightened than that. And we were for a while. Maybe we were. But I still like the idea we opened our front yards to the community. Community. That's why when... Um, when I have these discussions, shall we say, with secessionists who want to make their abodes part of greater Idaho, whatever that means. You mean like your own private Idaho? 
Everybody wants their own private Idaho. <sighs> but when I discuss these cases, they always talk about, well, <laughs> these urban dwellers. Urban dwellers. You mean black. People of color. Misfits. Mutants. What are you talking about, urban dwellers? What do you see when you say urban dwellers? Anyway, as opposed to, you know, the the exalted pure rural folk who have values of family and hard work and perseverance. And I'm thinking, what the hell are you talking about? People who live in cities who, you know, put in an hour and a half to get to work, don't have perseverance or a work ethic. Give me an effing break. I don't put it that way. Or maybe I do. <laughs> Depends on what venue I'm using. Do it in writing, and there's always this sense of distance. Or you can do it to their face and see what happens. I've always been able to do it in their face, but now I'm not so sure I can't run. Can any of us? Whew. So they have their idea of sense of community. That somehow, like, your small community is more exalted. Well, you know, people live in neighborhoods, you know. So if you want to get, I don't know, gang-like about it, sure. You want to wear colors? They have their kind of colors, in a way. I mean, blue denim with, I don't know, a lot of white skin. Whew. Blinding. Okay. Urban dwellers. Don't have the same values of ethics and morality. Give me a break. Yep. Every small town is in everybody's business. And is that any different than living in your own tiny little neighborhood where everybody knows what you're doing, what time you come out your door for work? <laughs> yeah. They're so different. No, they're not. This is America, damn it. Anyway, uh, I guess we're going to have uh, roving bands of brigands, and so we're going to have to wall our towns, hamlets, cities. And we'll see how that works. I thought we already went through this, but here we are. All right. Well, enough of that rant. Anyway. Oh, at the top about the Goldilocks documents. I thought that was uh, well described, and uh, I have to just wonder about how our our judge there down in Florida. You know, they keep using this term random. It sounds to me like the random lone wolf that always just seems to randomly show up somewhere doing the work of you know who and you know what. Jesus, just randomly happened. There's too many random instances in Judge Cannon's canon from randomly being picked as a Federalist Society uh, from, you know, their, their farm club, elevated very quickly to a uh, U.S. attorney randomly, randomly nominated as a judge in the last days of Trump's term. And in those last days, randomly rammed through and then randomly chosen twice from a deep pool of three. They keep saying, oh, there was four. Well, it should have been like 30 at least. Ah, But anyway, and there's not four. There was only three. Deep pool, randomly chosen twice to... A Donald Trump. I made mention that random is the new luck because, like luck, apparently you make your own random. Okay, something stinks. And I gotta tell you, it started stinking really bad when the Federalist Society and Heritage Foundation started getting their grubby little right-wing, white-wing fingers involved. 
hidden. Because if anybody found out, they'd get mad. And that's exactly what they argued. If people find out who and what we are, they're not going to want us to do it because they're Americans and we're fascists. Oh, I know. They put it as that they are really the true Americans. Well, that's what fascists say. Jeez. All right. I thought I was going to stop ranting. I guess not. What do we have in store for you here today and the rest of uh, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Salon here, out, out here in the virtual world of wherever? Well, we're out in the West Coast. Anyway, on the rest of the menu, in the Bistro Cafe of said salon, a jury ordered the electric utility company Pacific Corp to pay punitive damages for causing devastating wildfires in Oregon in 2020. And that's on top of fines already imposed that are probably going to be over a bill. Punitive is sometimes more? We'll see. A U.S. Marine and a second man were arrested on federal charges of firebombing a Planned Parenthood clinic in Southern California last year. And the House rejected MAGA efforts to censure and fine Adam Schiff over the Trump-Russia investigations. Oh, yeah, they're not going to politicize and weaponize government. Oh, no, it's only us. We have not weaponized anything. How about letting the law just do what the law does? Mm -hmm. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Canada has suspended work with a Chinese-founded development bank. While it investigates complaints, the bank has, quote, one of the most toxic cultures imaginable, end quote. And a U.S. appeals court rejected bail for a Steve Bannon-affiliated Chinese businessman awaiting trial in that $1 billion fraud case. You know, the guy whose yacht that Bannon was arrested on, and then he was arrested on later, too. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. So go and chat. Go and do it. <laughs> Thank you, Kelly. If you out there in radio listening land would look across the page at our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the left, from that chat room link, you will notice the uh, Patreon link there. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help us pay our bills and the other costs incurred in running this powerhouse of resistance. And uh, we thank you for your generosity in allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, and Spoutable, you can do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those, and thank you, Tom, for doing that and everything else that you and Kelly do. Thank you! If you would follow me on Twitter, Mastodon and Spoutable, at Justice Putnam, I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime as trucks drive by, and they're very loud today. But uh, regardless, uh, those show notes and links on those show notes and links diary is where you can find the actual articles that we riff off of here in this salon. And it's very important because, well, that's the the real reportage. And you can figure it out yourself. Please do. And if you would like to follow the show on Twitter while we're still there, you can do so at Cookbook West. And please pick up podcasts 
by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Okay, tisk tisk. Claire Rush and Jean Johnson of the Associated Press bring us this first offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A jury yesterday, Wednesday, in Portland, Oregon, ordered the electric utility Pacific Corp to pay punitive damages for causing devastating wildfires in Oregon in 2020, on top of an earlier verdict already expected expected to amount to billions of dollars, not a billion, billions, with an S. The decision came two days after jurors found Pacific Corp liable for the fires and said it must pay for damage to property as well as emotional distress. Well, I had to worry about my mom and her breathing. Maybe I'll get something. The jury on Monday awarded more than $70 million to 17 homeowners. Darn it, I guess I wasn't a plaintiff in the case. We get nothing. With damages to be determined later for a broader class that could include the owners of about 2,500 properties, as estimated by plaintiff's attorneys. I guess I don't get to say that my mom's breathing problems from the wildfire smoke perpetrated by this Pacific Corp caused me emotional distress, and I got to tell you, it did. But anyway, the property owners alleged that Pacific Corp negligently failed to shut off power to its 600,000 customers during a windstorm over Labor Day weekend, despite warnings from then-Governor Kate Brown's chief of staff and top fire officials and that its power lines were responsible for multiple blazes. Attorneys for the plaintiffs said that after the fires, Pacific Corp started an internal investigation without communicating that to workers in the field. As a result, the workers repaired or replaced some damaged equipment without documenting or preserving evidence of how broken poles or power lines contributed to the fires. They were covering up the evidence of a crime. The fires were among the worst natural disasters in Oregon's history. They killed nine people, burned more than 1,875 square miles, that's 1,875 square miles, and destroyed upward of 5,000 homes and structures. Now, Pacific Corp. is owned by Warren Buffett, uh, Omaha, Nebraska-based investment conglomerate Berkshire Hathaway, who said it plans to appeal. The Multnomah County Circuit jury court jury in Portland found Wednesday, yesterday, that the additional damages were warranted to punish the utilities' indifference to the safety of others and to deter such conduct in the future. at the National Desk for the Associated Press bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. A U.S. Marine and a second man were arrested yesterday, Wednesday, on federal charges of firebombing a Planned Parenthood clinic in Southern California last year. Agents of the FBI and the Naval Criminal Investigative Service arrested Tibet Ergel, 21, of Irvine, and Chance Brennan, 23, of San Juan Capistrano, a Marine stationed at Camp Pendleton, according to a statement from the office of U.S. Attorney Martin Estrada. They were named in a criminal complaint that charged each with using an explosive or fire to damage real property affecting interstate commerce. A Molotov cocktail was thrown at the front 
of the clinic in Costa Mesa around 1 a.m. on March 13th of 2022. Security video recorded two people in hooded sweatshirts and face masks carrying out the attack. The fire spread up a wall and across a ceiling above the front door, but responding firefighters and police were able to prevent the building from being destroyed. Now, no one was hurt, but the clinic had to cancel about 30 appointments, prosecutors said. Jalanek of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The House has rejected an effort to censure California Representative Adam Schiff, turning aside a Republican attempt to find the Democrat over his comments about Trump and the investigations into his ties to Russia. Schiff, the former Democratic chairman of the House Intel Committee and the lead prosecutor in Trump's first impeachment trial, has long been a top Republican political target. Soon after taking back the majority this year, Republicans blocked him from sitting on the intelligence panel. But Schiff was helped yesterday Wednesday by more than 20 Republicans who voted with Democrats to stop the censure resolution or voted present, giving Democrats enough votes to block the measure. The vote was a rare victory for Democrats in the Republican-led House, and they cheered and patted Schiff on the back after the vote was gaveled down. Florida Representative Anna Polina Luna, she's the George Santos of Florida, by the way, look into her resume. A newly elected repug, that's in my reporter's opinion, by the way, who sponsored the measure passed Schiff in the hallway after the vote and told him she would try again. Luna later tweeted that she would remove a portion of the resolution that suggested a $16 million fine if the House Ethics Committee determined that Schiff lied, made misrepresentations, or abused sensitive information. This is after Trump's been having boxes in his loo. The resolution says that Schiff held positions of power during Trump's presidency and abused this trust by saying there was evidence of collusion between Trump's Trump's campaign and Russia. Well, of course, it was uh, proven in the Mueller investigation that they all just randomly disregard. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Welcome to Science Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. I'm Andrea Thompson, SIAM's editor for Earth and Environment. Today, we're talking fire and smoke. Here's what you need to know about the wildfire smoke blanketing the eastern U.S. right now. And even if you're not living downwind at the moment, 
we've got a lot of news you can use on smoke, air quality, and how to protect your health. I've pulled together a bunch of local experts, my very smart Scientific American colleagues, hashtag smoke nerds. By the way, we've got our expert recommendations for sites and apps you should use to check the air quality and whether wildfire smoke is in your forecast. So make sure to listen all the way to the end. Megan Bartels is a news reporter here. Lauren Young is associate health editor. Tanya Lewis is our senior health editor for news. Hey, y'all. Hey. Hello. Hey. So where should we start? I think the obvious place to start is where is the smoke coming from? I'll take this one. The smoke is coming from Canada, in particular for the current event, mainly wildfires in Quebec. But Canada has had a terrible wildfire season across the whole country. There have been more than 400 fires so far this year, and they've burned more than 9 million acres. Fires have also been bad out west in Alberta and British Columbia, and smoke from those fires swept down over Montana and Colorado in May, causing really poor air quality. All of these fires are happening because Canada has seen stubborn, hot, dry weather, including record high temperatures in May. So when there is a spark, for example, in the form of lightning from thunderstorms, fires can really take off. So we know where it's coming from, but how long can we expect the smoke to last? How is it moving? Megan, I know you've been reporting on that. Yeah, so it turns out it's really difficult to predict how long the smoky conditions might last. The wildfires themselves are likely to keep burning for a while. A Canadian fire analyst I spoke to says he hopes conditions there might ease up a little next week to at least reduce the number of fires that are starting. From there, it's a matter of where the wind is blowing and how high the smoke is in the atmosphere. Sometimes smoke stays high up and just creates some haze. But this week, the smoke has been hanging out close to the surface, which makes it a much bigger problem. Geographically, the interaction between a high-pressure system over Canada and a low-pressure system east of it have sent the smoke south. Over the past few days, the smoke has moved, plaguing New York on Wednesday, then heading down into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland on Thursday. You can check your local branch of the National Weather Service or airnow.gov for forecast information. Thanks for that, Megan. So those experiencing this event probably want to know what's in the smoke. What should people pay attention to? AQI, PM2.5, what do these things mean? Lauren, can you tell us more about that? Sure. So when we think about air quality, we look at the air quality index, which is a color-coded 500-point scale that ranks air quality in your area. And one of the primary measurements for the index is particulate matter 2.5. The shorthand of that is PM 2.5, which are fine particles that are 2.5 microns or smaller across. You can't see these harmful particles, but they can be inhaled deeply into the lungs. With smoke and air pollution, you also have volatile organic compounds, That's what gives the smoke its sort of acrid, distinct smell. These compounds are toxic and are small enough to slip past face masks. But the thing about a lot of wildfires these days is that they are increasingly burning residential communities. That means on top of the plants and the vegetation that burns in forest wildfire, you're also burning things like paint thinners, detergents, plastics, cars, and so on. Yikes. So what are the health risks from these things and and who are the most vulnerable groups? This smoke can really impact people with pre-existing conditions. So people with asthma, cardiopulmonary disease, lung disease, what it does is it can worsen your condition and make it more difficult to control symptoms. I talked to Alana Jaspers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She told me her patients come in sometimes needing more medication. So they're wheezing, they have shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Children, especially those under the age of five, can have a twofold increase in asthma, The smoke can not only make your asthma worse, but it can actually induce it, so it ups your chances of an asthma attack. Adults older than 65 also should be careful with wildfire smoke exposure. Even less than a day's worth of exposure from smoke hundreds of miles away can cause an increase in heart attacks and strokes. Kari Nato at Harvard University told me that some research has found the increased risk of stroke goes up by 40% from wildfire smoke exposure. Dr. Nato also told me that people of color and underserved communities are disproportionately affected by extreme weather events like wildfire. A lot of research has shown these groups are already at high risk of health issues because of where they may live and the discrimination they face. Dr. Nato explained that people of color in the U.S. are more likely to live near toxic waste dumps or industries that may emit pollution. These populations already have had sensitization to other toxicants, so wildfire smoke is another variable on top of that. So are there health risks even for healthy people? Is there research into what continuous exposure to wildfire smoke over multiple seasons does to our lungs? 
Yeah, so there are absolutely risks. No one is immune from wildfire smoke symptoms. Even within eight hours of being exposed to just a little bit of wildfire smoke hundreds of miles away, you can start feeling the effects. Common ones are itchy throat, coughing, watery eyes, your skin starts itching or becomes dry. Within days to weeks, people can start seeing changes in asthma, heart attack, and stroke. There was a paper published last year that showed that brain cancer and lung cancer increases not only in wildfire fighters, but also in communities that have been exposed for many years to wildfire smoke. People who are pregnant should also be careful because smoke has been linked with premature and stillbirth. A really important thing to note is the mental health aspects of all of this. Seeing and being immersed in these dense clouds of orange-brown smoke, it's unsettling. It's stressful. If you start to feel anxious, reach out to others or to a counselor. Research has also shown that people can develop post-traumatic stress disorder after wildfire events and smoke. Dr. Nato says that we should all be compassionate and give people agency to talk about climate-related anxiety to others. I think we've all felt a little stressed the last couple of days. Tanya, can you tell us what people who aren't used to dealing with wildfire can do to protect themselves? Yeah, so first of all, limit your time outside especially strenuous activities like exercise. If you have to go outside, wear a high-quality mask like an N95 or KN95. You probably still have some lying around from COVID. When you're inside, keep your windows closed. If you have an air purifier, run that on high. There are lots of options out there, ranging from about $50 to well over $300. I have a couple that I like that are $150 to $200. You want something with HEPA or MERV filters. Those are the kind used in hospitals that block really small particles like those found in wildfire smoke. And make sure it's strong enough for the size of room you're in. If commercial purifiers are too pricey, you can also build your own version. During the pandemic, some scientists came up with a design called a Corsi-Rosenthal box to protect against COVID. It's basically a box fan and four or five HEPA filters duct taped together in a cube, and it also works for air pollution. I built one myself last year, and it's proven pretty useful in the last couple of days here in New York. They can be a bit loud, but it's worth it for the good air quality. If you don't have a purifier or Corsi Rosenthal box, but you do have an AC, you can run that and it will provide some filtration. Just make sure it's not pulling in outside air. Fortunately, most window units just recycle inside air. You can also plug up poorly sealed windows with wet towels or painter's tape to prevent air from leaking in. If you don't live somewhere where you can seal the windows and filter the air, try to go somewhere that does, like an office or library. Just remember, wear a good mask on your way there and back. Thanks, Tanya. I have definitely been wearing a mask outside this week. So finally, something people may be wondering is, do we think this could become a more regular issue in our rapidly changing climate? Another question I'll take. So climate change does prime things for more and stronger wildfires because the hot, dry conditions that help fuel them are becoming more likely and more intense. But factors like forest management also come into play. This can affect how much fuel, branches, leaves, and other detritus there is to burn. And then where smoke from those fires goes will depend on weather conditions at the time. So the point is, the future will be hazy and possibly smoke-filled. Okay, last thing before we go. You've made it this far. Here's a list of sites that we all like if you want to check your personal air quality. There's airnow.gov, IQ Air, Purple Air, and your local National Weather Service office. You can get there by Googling your town and NWS. And we'll link to all of these in the show transcript. Thanks again for joining us on this special wildfire episode of Science Quickly. Science Quickly is produced by Jeff Del Vizio, Corinne Leung, Talika Bose, and Kelso Harper. Our show music was composed by Dominic Smith. Like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For a daily dose of science, sign up for our new Today in Science newsletter. Our colleague, Andrea Gerleski, delivers some of the most interesting and awe-inspiring science news, opinion, and whatever else strikes your fancy to your inbox each afternoon. We think you'll enjoy it. Check it out at siam.com slash newsletters. For Science Quickly, I'm Andrea Thompson. Tanya Lewis. Lauren Young and Megan Bartels. If you came across someone struggling with hunger, how would you recognize them? By their clothes, their age, the way they speak? 
Would you notice an eight-year-old girl who's not excited, excited for, for summer, summer break? Because she may not be having lunch again until September. Or a single father of two who works three, three part-time jobs and still can't put enough food on the table. Or maybe a mother who cleans offices at night. Hoping to find meeting leftovers to take home to her hungry family. Or a war veteran who's, who's having, having a hard time, time landing, landing a job and getting back on his feet. I am the one in eight Americans who struggle with hunger. People you pass by every day but never knew were hungry. I am hunger in America. Hunger can be hard to recognize. Learn why at IamHungerInAmerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America, 200 Food Bank Strong, and the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? It's all we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Donna Phillips. Today we introduce our series on principles of the Constitution as part of our Civil Discourse and American Legacy Project. We are joined today by special guest Dr. Lester Brooks, American History Professor Emeritus from Anne Arundel Community College. Great to have you here today, Dr. Brooks. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you here today. Thank you. Dr. Brooks, why was there a need for a new constitution in the 1780s? The Articles of Confederation, the first constitution, go into effect in 1781. It laid that foundation that we still wrestle with today. Who will have the lion's share of power? Will it be the states or a central government? They established a unicameral legislature. And increasingly what they found was there were weaknesses. The Congress could not levy taxes. It could uh, declare war, but it couldn't raise an army. So over time in the 1780s, they began to realize revisions needed to be made. Uh, they wanted to uh, make possibly amendments. And so that was the, 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 the real need for something to be done. Uh, revisions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Brooks. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1908. That was the day that the Executive Board of the American Federation of Labor established its Metal Trades Department. The goal was to coordinate the organizing and legislative efforts of those in the many metal trades. The department joined together workers from sheet metal workers to blacksmiths, iron shipbuilders to brass and silver workers, foundry workers to stove mounters, and more. In all, 600,000 workers were members. The new department held its first convention in Cincinnati, Ohio that following February. One of the earliest major work projects involving the new department was the construction of the Panama Canal. More than 70,000 workers, including many metal workers, worked on the canal over a decade. By the time the canal was completed in 1914, more than 5,000 workers had died on the project. The metals department often had to navigate an ever-changing demand for the skills of its members. In times of war, as orders for battleships soared, the workers were in high demand. 
during peacetime, orders fell. In 1945, the U.S. Navy recognized the contribution of metal workers during World War II. They christened the USS Joseph S. McDonough. The ship was named after a former secretary treasurer of the Metal Trades Department who had worked in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. One of the key victories of the Metal Department was the passage of the 1938 Federal Apprenticeship and Training Act. The year prior, Metal Department President John Fry was appointed by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt as the labor representative for the first apprenticeship committee. The act formalized apprenticeship training programs. Today, the Metals Department of the AFL-CIO represents thousands of workers in 17 unions. Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River. In the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 57 degrees here at the mothership, expecting highs in the low 80s, could even be a bit warmer than that. Plenty of sunshine throughout the day with winds out of the north-northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour so it'll be a little brisk today. That's good. A few clouds overnight. Lows in the mid-50s with winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then sun and a few passing clouds tomorrow with highs around 90. Winds out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And it does look like we may have some uh, a bit of rain coming with thunderstorms late this weekend. We'll keep track of that. Grass pollen is rated very high here in our little hamlet of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 19 parts per million. And that daytime UV index is very high at level 9, so take care. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.13 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is hovering around 75%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And that's why it's not only called the Weather Underground, it is the Weather Underground. London is 81 degrees and partly cloudy. Paris is 84 and sunny. Rome is 75 and partly cloudy with a thunderstorm advisory that could impact their critical electrical infrastructure. Kiev is 78 and partly cloudy. Kabul is 75 and clear. Hong Kong is 83 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 70 degrees and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 45 degrees with a winter clear. San Francisco, California is 58 degrees and mostly cloudy. And they continue to have their morning small craft advisory on the bay for heavy fog. And New York, New York is 72 degrees Fahrenheit and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world.
Joe McDonald of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Canada's finance minister says it is suspending activity with a Chinese-founded development bank while it investigates complaints by a Canadian who resigned from the lender that it is dominated by Communist Party hacks and his country should not be a member. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank confirmed yesterday Wednesday in an email that Bob Pickard resigned as its Director General of Global Communications and rejected his criticism as unfounded. The AIIB, seen by some as a Chinese rival to the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank, was founded in 2016 to finance railways and other infrastructure, as so they say. It has 106 member governments, including most Asian countries, along with Australia, Canada, Russia, France, and Britain, while Japan and the United States are not members. The government of Canada will immediately halt all government-led activity at the bank. Christia Freeland, who is also Deputy Prime Minister, told reporters in Ottawa, I have instructed the Department of Finance to lead an immediate review of the allegations raised and of Canada's involvement in the AIIB as the world's democracies work to de-risk our economies by limiting our strategic vulnerabilities to authoritarian regimes. We must likewise be clear about the means through which these Regimes exercise their influence around the world, Freeland said. Pickard, who worked in communications for AIIB for 15 months, said on Twitter that resigning was his only course as a patriotic Canadian. He complained the bank was dominated by, quote, Communist Party hacks who were like an in-house KGB or Gestapo or Stasi the secret police of the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and the communist era East Germany. The Beijing headquartered bank has one of the most toxic cultures imaginable, Pickard wrote. I do not believe that my country's interests are served by its AIIB membership. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Larry Newmeister of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A self-exiled Chinese businessman awaiting trial in a $1 billion fraud case will remain behind bars after an appeals court rejected his request to override a lower court's finding that he might flee or harm the community if he were to be freed. The second U.S. Court of Appeals in Manhattan said in a two-page order that Gua Wang Wei's lawyers had failed to convince a three-judge panel that Judge Annalisa Torres made a clear error in refusing to accept a $25 million bail package proposal in April. Toro said she didn't trust that Gao, listed in court papers under the name Ho Wan Kwok, would obey court orders if he was released on strict conditions, including GPS monitoring and a 24-hour armed guard. She also wrote that he posed a threat to the community. 
Gao was arrested in March, pleaded not guilty to charges including wire and securities fraud. Prosecutors say said he fleeced thousands of investors in two good to be true offerings that promised outsized profits for investors in his media companies. He then used those proceeds from the five year fraud scheme starting in twenty eighteen to buy extravagant extravagant goods and assets for himself and his family. His lawyer, though, say he is broke. Guo was once thought to be among the richest people in China before he left in 2014 during a crackdown on corruption that ensnared individuals close to him, including a top intelligence official. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TL, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coère Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver